I know we didn't get a chance to tell you, but uh, happy belated Thanksgiving uh, to everybody. We hope that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving break. It is great to see each and every one of you uh, here this morning to our first time in returning guests. Thank you so much for joining us in worship uh, here at Harvest Fellowship. Uh, today, we're going to continue in our series. Uh, for those of y'all that are joining us for the first time today, we are in a series on the book of Joshua. Uh, it's an Old Testament book. And so if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Joshua and turn to chapter four or scroll to chapter four. Book of Joshua, chapter four. We're in a series that I've entitled God, Our Promise Keeper. And we are walking through the book of Joshua together. Because of the extensiveness of this passage, I'm not going to read all 24 verses to you. I only want to read a couple of verses in your hearing this morning. We will look at the entire chapter, um, so I invite you to keep your Bibles open with me. So if you're there in Joshua chapter 4, I'll be reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible, and I'll read in your hearing verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take twelve men from the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take twelve stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful to you. You are great and greatly to be praised. This morning, Father, we do not take it for granted <clears throat> that by your grace, you decided to open our eyes to see a brand new day. And we're grateful that your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And we thank you that when we are and have been faithless towards you, you continue to be faithful towards us in Christ. We thank you that you haven't thrown us away, that you haven't rejected us. Those of us who have placed our trust in Jesus are forever your children. And we are grateful for that. And Father, we pray this morning that as we continue to worship you, we ask that you would help us to have ears to hear today, hearts to receive, and a will to obey. We ask, Father, that you will be kind towards us, that you will open up our eyes, that we may see wonderful truths from your word. God, forgive us. We have sinned against you. We have done things you told us not to do. We have not done things you told us to do. We thank you that in Christ we can come to you and confess our sins and you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. We pray you will speak to every heart in the room, children included, from the youngest of us to the oldest of us. Do this for your glory, by your spirit, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to title today's message, Stones of Remembrance. Stones of Remembrance. There's an old hymn entitled, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, in which the last verse says this. O oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, God, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. For those of us who have turned from our sin by God's grace and placed our trust in Jesus as our Savior and Lord, we have been forgiven of all of our sins and we have been made right with God. 
One of the spiritual blessings we have in Jesus is not only that we have been made right with God and have been forgiven of all of our sins, past, present and future. We also have been blessed with a new heart. This new heart that we have been given in Christ seeks to please God. We have a new heart that seeks to obey God in every area of our lives. We are spiritually hardwired, if you will, to follow after God. And yet, due to remaining sin in the flesh, there still resides in our lives the possibility to disobey God. The possibility to wander away from him. As Don Calvin writes, the children of God are freed through redemption from bondage to sin. Yet they do not obtain full possession of freedom so as to feel no more annoyance from their flesh. But there still remains in them a continuing occasion for struggle whereby they may be exercised. He continues, there remains in a regenerate man, and I will add a woman, a smoldering cinder of evil from which desires continually leap forth to allure and spur him or her to commit sin. The sway of sin is abolished in them for the spirit dispenses a power whereby they may gain the upper hand and become victors in the struggle. But sin ceases only to reign it does not also cease to dwell in them. Sin doesn't reign over us, but yet it still remains in us. From God, as the hymn writer said, we are prone to wander. It doesn't mean that we will actually wander or we must wander or we are obligated to wander from God, but there remains in us a proclivity, a tendency in our flesh to wander from God. Now I need to say here for a minute, parenthetically to, to those of us in the room, that, that what you just heard is not a excuse or a justification to live sinfully. It is not an excuse. It is not a justification for us to live in a carnal fashion. As Christians, and sometimes those of us, we in our carnal minds and in our fleshly immature state, try to justify Come on, bro. Come on. our disobedience to God. Come on, bro. Come on. God knows my heart. Yeah, yeah. Come on, bro. He, he'll forgive me. On, I don't have to strive against sin. On, I, I thought oh, none of us are perfect. That's a given. Yeah. God is not after in this life perfection. He is after progression on, that will ultimately lead in and end in us being perfect like he is perfect right. when Christ comes to take right. us right. as his own. Right. So this is no justification for that. But the point still remains that there is remaining sin in our lives and that we are prone to wander from God. And if we're honest today, there are moments in each and every one of our lives. Yes, Come on, y'all. Yes. Well, we can look back and we have wandered uh, yes. away. Yes. We drift away in some area of our lives from God and his word. So we know why we are prone to wander from God and not do what he commands of us. But have you considered how it tends to happen, though? How do we wander away from God? No believer just wakes up one morning out of the blue and simply decides in that moment, I think I'm going to wander away from God today. No, no believer wakes up in the morning in that moment and says, I think I'll stop going to church altogether today. No believer wakes up in the morning and out of the blue just says, I think I'll treat my husband disrespectfully today. No believer just wakes up out of the blue in the morning and just says, I, I think I'll not concern myself with caring for my wife like Christ desires me to. Or I'll think I'll waste my youthful years pursuing sinful pleasures. Or 
I think I'll squander the gift of singleness by pursuing happiness my way instead of God's way. I think I'll just today just stop honoring God by not financially giving my first and best to him. Because after all, it's my money and I think I should be able to do what what what, what I want with it because it's after all, it's mine. I think I'll prioritize my wants over God's will. I think I'll just continue to hold on to this grudge, bitterness, resentment, resentment, rather than to obey God and let it go and forgive the person who hurt me, who sinned against me, who offended me. No believer wakes up in the morning out of the blue and just decides, I think I'll, I'll disregard God's wisdom and hang around and attach myself to a group of people who have no regard for God. My Lord. I think I'll just look to people and possessions and accomplishments for my significance, identity and value rather than God. No believer wakes up in the morning and out of the blue just decides in that moment that I'm going to wander from God. From my study of scripture, I have come to discover that how we tend to wander away from God is due um, to us forgetting God. Our unfaithfulness towards God is the byproduct of our forgetfulness of God. When we forget the Lord, we tend to wander from the Lord. An example of this would be none other than the people of Israel, specifically the older generation of Israelites. Those who were 20 years or older, who were banned from entering into the promised land by God, and instead they died in the wilderness. I don't have time to go through how they forgot God and what they did to forget God, but Psalm 7811 summarizes well what facilitated Israel's disobedience to God. And here it is. They forgot his works, and the wonders that he had shown them. Their forgetfulness, hear me, was not merely an effect of human limitation or weakness. They didn't forget God like someone who mistakenly forgets to turn off the lights. They didn't forget God like someone who just mistakenly forgot to set the alarm before leaving the house. They didn't they didn't mistakenly forget God like in that sense of like someone who forgets to put an ingredient in a recipe. That's why you didn't eat certain things at Thanksgiving because somebody left out an an ingredient. Right. That they accidentally left out an ingredient. No, no. They forgot God in the sense that they willfully disregarded the wondrous works God performed on their behalf. They willfully disregarded it. So don't think when you hear the word forgot that they just simply had a had a mental lapse. No, that they willfully disregarded the wondrous works of God performed on their behalf. Now stands before us in this passage this morning in Joshua chapter four is the, the younger generation of Israelites who survived the 40 year wilderness wanderings. It's a new generation. What I love about this is that is that God, um, he, he, he is an individual God. He's also a generational God. Yeah. And what I mean by that is that for every generation, every generation has to stand on their own two feet and bow their own knees before God themselves. Yeah. Yeah. God, God dealt with the older generation and now God is dealing with this younger generation, this new generation generation of Israelites. God has just performed wonders among this younger generation. We covered this two Sundays ago in chapter three, similar to what God did for their ancestors in the crossing of the Red Sea. God cut off the raging overflowing waters of the Jordan and he completely dried up the riverbed, which allowed the Israelites to quickly cross over on dry ground. Unencumbered. You got to you got to get that. I know this miracle is so, so ancient to us, but it was a it was a wondrous miracle that God performed. 
We, I'm not going to rehash everything, but God cut the waters off, caused the Jordan River waters to go 18 miles upstream and stand in one heap, kind of an, an apocalyptic kind of big old wave and a dry, not just that, but dried up. Y'all ain't, you, y'all ain't hear me. Some of, you know, some of us, we wet our carpet, right? And we got to get, you know, towels and stuff and got to soak it. It still is a little wet after we done trying to get it up. But God, in his power, dried up the riverbed. I'm talking about in an instant. This ain't like no like 24 hour thing. This ain't no 48 hour things. The way the text reads that God did this in an instant. In a few moments, God split this sea, split this river, dried up the riverbed for the people to cross over. They crossed over. God literally created a pathway where there was none. God made a way out of no way. I just need to put a pin there, and I know that I got some people in the room. And you've been a witness to the fact that God has done that in your life, has he not? That God created a pathway for you where there was none. That God made a way out of no way for you, just as he did for his people. God did this. And he didn't want them to forget it. He did it and he didn't want them to forget it. So according to verses one through three of chapter four, you'll see there with me. He instructed Joshua to take 12 men, one from each tribe. There were 12 tribes of Israel. One man from each tribe. He commanded them that they were to go into the midst of the river where the priests stood and they were to take one large stone. This was not a rock. This was not a pebble because they had to carry this on their shoulder. Each man was to take one stone from the middle of the Jordan where the priest's feet stood firmly and they were to bring them over where they were going to stay that evening. The Bible reports, I hope you still have the text open with me, in verses 4 through 5 in verse 8 that Joshua and the 12 men did exactly what God had instructed them to do. After the people had finished passing over the Jordan, according to verse one, the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came up from the midst of the Jordan, Jordan. And the Bible records in verse 18 that as soon as the soles of the priest's feet touched the dry shore on the other side of the river, that the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. Once the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal. We learned they were at Gilgal in verse 19. Joshua took those 12 stones and set them up in a visible place for all the people to see. They were, these stones were to serve as a memorial to the people of Israel, a visual reminder of God's intervention on their behalf. And from this point in Israel's history, I want to give you five reasons why you and I, even as New Testament believers in Jesus, should be encouraged to gather our own stones of remembrance. Stones, obviously, are not literal stones as they would be in Israel's case. Stones in our case would be things like the visual, physical, written or verbal ways we capture God's activity in our lives. It could be. A, a, a picture. It could be a social media yes. post. It could be a journal entry. It yes. could be some way of preserving some object related to God, God's activity in your life. On, These stones of remembrance are simply testimonies of God's wonders performed in our lives. So I want to give you these five reasons and then we'll be out of here. Reason number one as to why You and I should be encouraged by Israel's example to gather stones of remembrance, to gather testimonies of God's work in our lives is quite simply and quite frankly, number one, it points to God's miraculous workings in our lives. Mm -hmm. We need to gather these stones, these testimonies, because it points to God's miraculous works in our lives. Your stone may be a moment when God healed your body. Right, right, right. And you may, you may still have the hospital tag mm. that you wore. Yeah. Don't throw it away. Not trying, to keep, not trying to encourage you to be a hoarder, 
<laughs> but it may, it may, it just may be a stone that you need to hold on to. Come on, Doc. Come on, man. Because it points to the fact that God miraculously worked in your life. Yes. I want to tell somebody, don't, don't, don't be, don't be ashamed of that scar. Come on, Doc. Maybe you maybe you had some kind of surgery. Maybe there was some C-section you had as a mother, whatever it is. Maybe there's an injury of some sort that you have and you have a scar that's left on your body. Don't be ashamed of that scar. Come on, Doc. Come on, man. Many of y'all know this. If you've been around me, you've probably walked behind me at certain points or seen me turn my head. And you'll know that I have a physical scar on the back of my head. This physical scar uh, has caused me to be the brunt of so many um, kiddish, juvenile, sophomoric pranks and bullying when I was in middle school and high school. People would look at me and they would say, I have a third eye. I can see out the back of my head. <laughs> Y'all can laugh. It's okay. I'm not insecure about it anymore. <laughs> but I had to learn that even as I grew up as a kid, that it bothered me when people would say that they would make fun of me because I had this physical scar on the back of my head and it caused me to have a complex where I would walk down with my head down all the time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because I was afraid to lift my head up because I didn't want people to see my scar and they would make fun of me. Yeah, yeah. But, but along the way, as I grew in Christ, God helped me to, to not be ashamed of that scar. Yeah. Because for some people, that scar may have been a point of making fun and making light of me. But for me... It was a reminder. Come on, Doc. Come on, Pete. Come on, man. It was a reminder that I was born three months premature. Woo! Oh, my God. In a time in which medical technology and, and apparatuses were not advanced as they were today. It reminded me of how I had to stay months Come in on, the man. hospital, lying, laying up in an incubator on, on my back. And that was my hair was there. It, it left a scar because my head had, I couldn't move and I had all these tubes in my body. But it reminded me. That, that God did a wonder in my life. I said so every time that they would make fun of me and make fun of that scar while they were making fun of me, I was getting my praise on because it was a reminder that God had done a miraculous work in my life, that he had saved my life from death. And I want to tell you, I don't know what your scar is. People may make light of it, may make fun of it, but don't be ashamed of that scar. Let it be a reminder that God, God preserved you in some way. God saved you in some way. God delivered you in some way. Oh, yeah. He healed your body. Your stone may be an abiding physical ailment. Mm -hmm. All right. mm -hmm. Yeah. You may have a limp like Jacob. Come on, Doc. Mm -hmm. Come on. But don't be ashamed of that limp because that limp shows that your life has been changed yeah. by God. That God changed your name, yeah. changed the direction of your life. And that limp yes. is just evidence of it. Come on, Doc. Yes. Come on. Yes. Uh. Praise God. Or you may have a thorn in the flesh like Paul. Yo, that, that thorn in the flesh was not necessarily related to God changing your life, but that thorn in the flesh is there to keep you humble. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. of what God has done in your life, because of how God has gifted you, because of your experience, because of your skill set, because of your education, because of just your fortitude, because of something that God has done in your life. And you are strong in it. You are good in it. And you are you are gifted in it. God doesn't want you to get conceited. Yeah. So so he may give you some type of thorn in your flesh to on, keep you humble. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> your stone may be that legal document. That shows the finalizing of your divorce. How God brought you out of a marriage to an unfaithful, unrepentant spouse. Gather that stone up. I know, I know it may hurt. I know it may, may, it may disappoint you, but that's a stone of remembrance. Your stone might be that journal entry that details how God sustained you in the devastating death of that loved one. Or how God sustained you in another difficult season of your life. Your stone may be that degree or certification that you need to hang up. And it shows how God strengthened you to complete that major milestone in your life. I thought I had more testimonies there because some of y'all graduated from college and you act like you did it. You didn't do it on your own. God was the one who got you through that, matriculated you through that university. Thanks, sure enough. Y'all better give credit to where credit is due. 
You didn't get yourself to college. Matter of fact, you were partying your way. You, you, were, you weren't even studying the way that you should have been God. studying. On, but the God. grace of God kept you, on, straightened you up just in time, yeah. got your mind together just in time so you can get the credits you need to graduate from college. Right. You, ain't, you ain't graduated from college, but you graduated from high school. On, and you God. know that shouldn't have happened the way that you were fooling and acting wild. But God, in his grace, it's a stone of remembrance. Yes. You need to keep that cap and gown. Yes. At least keep the tassel. Keep, some, keep something. <laughs> That's a stone of remembrance. Hello, somebody. A stone of remembrance. The stone for some of you might be that job offer letter that you need to hold on to that shows God's faithfulness to provide for you even after a year or two or three years of unemployment. Stones of remembrance. We, we, it points to God's miraculous workings in our lives. As I told you two Sundays ago, God has, he does all types of wonders, but there's a chief wonder that God has done for us as believers. That, that chief wonder is the fact that you and I have been made alive in Christ Jesus. And we have been transferred from the kingdom of the domain of darkness into his marvelous light, into the kingdom of his beloved son. And I want to tell you, as Christians, as the people of God today, we have two stones of remembrance related to God's salvation in Christ Jesus. The first stone is the mark of baptism. Yeah, it is. Baptism is a sign and a symbol of faith in Jesus. It points to, it visibly points to and portrays our union with Christ in his burial, his death, his burial, and his resurrection yeah. from the dead for our sins in our place. Yeah. I want to encourage somebody. This is the reason why if you haven't been baptized, you need to be baptized. Come on, Doc. Yeah. It's, it's, it's God's ordained stone that we need to con- continually observe and do because it reminds us of his salvation towards us in Christ Jesus. This is why the church does this all the time. This is why we will baptize Lord willing if the weather is good, if it ain't raining, even if it's cold, we baptize him. We're going to get in that pool. It's going to be cold, but we baptize. This is why we baptize him on the first Sunday of next month. This is why churches do that, because it is a sign. It's a symbol of God's wondrous works of salvation, wondrous work of salvation in Christ in our lives. There's the mark of baptism. But then there's the memorial of the Lord's Supper. Yes. A few years ago, my wife and I, we took a vacation uh, to New York, where she's from, and we decided to drive to Washington, D.C. Uh, from New York. Love the East Coast because that's one of the things you can do. You can drive three, four hours and cross a number of states. Whereas in Texas, you drive, you know, yeah. you, you know, <laughs> depending on where you go, right? I know you can drive three hours, get out of, out of Texas into Oklahoma, but if you drive in East Texas, it's going to take you longer than three hours so, to get to East know. Texas. Wow. Out of Texas, it's a westward, right? Wow. Or eastward, right? Yeah. All right, so we went to D.C. and we went there to tour the historical monuments of our nation's capital. So we were there and we, we, we walked the Lincoln Memorial. We saw, we saw the reflecting pool and it was awesome. It was awesome. It was a quite, a quite uh, honestly, a, a quite, you know, a good sight to see. It was just a sight to behold. I think we had segways that we had, we had rode on there. Y'all remember segways? We had segways that we were riding around in D.C. But also located on north of the Lincoln Memorial was what they call the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. It's also known as the Wall That Heals. The memorial includes the names of over 58,000 servicemen and women who gave their lives in service to the Vietnam conflict. Although we thank God for their service and, and we do honor each and every one of them who have given their lives in service to us. There is only one name on God's wall of spiritual healing Come on, Doc. who sacrificed his life for us. And that name yes, is Jesus. Yes, There's only one name on that wall. Yes, sir. I don't care what people tell you. They, 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 they may put Buddha's name. They can't put Buddha's name up on that wall. They, they, can't, they can't put Confucius name up on that wall. They can't put Muhammad's name up on that wall. They, they can't put anybody that they want their spiritual heroes or founders. They can't put their name up on that wall. The only name that is etched in stone, the only name that is there permanently is the name of Jesus. First Peter chapter two 
verse 24 says he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his stripes or wounds. We have been healed. So until Jesus returns, the Lord himself through the apostle Paul told us that we ought to continually take the Lord's Supper in yes. honor of him. Yes. Right. He told us, he told us through the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that his body was broken for us yes. on the yes. cross. And this bread represents his body. And as often as you take this bread, you yes. will do this in remembrance of him. Yes. And that this cup, it represents his blood that was shed on the cross for the remission of our sins. And as often as you drink of this and we drink of this, we do this in remembrance of him. This is one of the reasons why we ought not to take the Lord's Supper just lightly. Yes, sir. Yeah. That we ought to yes, miss sir. out when we know we're going to take the Lord's Supper. It is a memorial to our Lord and Savior. It proclaims his death until he comes. It's a visible symbol. Yeah. Are y'all with me? A sign that points to the miraculous work of God in salvation in Christ for us. So we have one reason why we ought to gather that stone and gather these stones is because it points to God's miraculous works. In our lives. Number two, the second reason as to why we ought to gather stones of remembrance is that it helps us to pass on the accounts of God's intervention to younger generations. Yes. It helps us yes. to pass on the accounts of God's intervention to younger generations. Look at me in verse six. He says that this, this what being why you ought to pass and take these stones up upon your shoulder that this may be a sign among you when your children, are y'all there with me? Yes. Ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Mm. Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. And then he gives us more information, but he repeats it in verse 21. And he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers, or you can say mothers as well, in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know. Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. We have a sacred responsibility, brothers and sisters, to pass on the faith to a younger generation. For those of us that are in the older generation, 30s and 40s and 50s or whatever, we, we need to pass on the gospel yes. Yes. to our children. We need to pass on God's word to our children. We need to pass on the testimonies of God's wondrous works in our lives to our kids. Yes. This yes. is why we will. We this is why we do family worship. Come on, Come on hear me, y'all. Yeah, yeah. I know it's I know it's a thing, you know, for some that you want you want convenience when you go to your church. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, I think sometimes our consumeristic society has bled into our Christian society yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. where we think that the church ought to cater to everything we want. Come on, Doc. But we treat it again like a Walmart. Come on, Doc. Burger King. You can have it your way. We're here to serve you like it's a Chick-fil-A, which is we just and I love Chick-fil-A. I ain't, 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 ain't hating on Chick-fil-A. <laughs> Well, we just come and they, we just, there's going to be people that's going to serve our every need mm. and our every desire. Yeah. And all I'm doing is I'm paying my money, going through the drive. I ain't got no investment in this chain. Wow. Wow. I just want what I want so I can get out. Wow. God says, no, no, we have a responsibility to pass on the faith, that's to right. serve younger generations. Right. Um. So this is why we do family worship. Mm -hmm. This is why we take, it's just one Sunday on, out of the month, and sometimes two, where we gather our kids together with us. Uh -huh. Why? It's so that they can see us yes, give glory to Jesus. On, they can see us lifting our hands and giving authentic praise to Jesus. They can see us serving one another. They can see our fellowship of one another. They can see our commitment to Christ through his church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that they can, that in a way we are through our actions, through our commitment, passing on the yes, faith. Yes, right. We're teaching our kids what's important in life. Come on, what's ultimately important in life is not your sports. 
What's ultimately important in life is not a scholarship to school. All that has its place. What's, what's important, what's most important is, is not the, the newest Jordans and the clothes and the bling and all of that. That, that, that. The fame and the, what's the most important is God himself in Christ. And his kingdom and his agenda and his will and his purposes. Don't be surprised. Listen, I, and, and if we can't put the blame all on us. We know they're going to ultimately stand on their own individual merits. They got to make their own decisions. But, man, we don't be surprised when we have played shuck and jive with God and they end up forsaking God. Because we've been we've been faking the funk in front of them. Um, But God has a responsibility. It's a privilege for us to pass on the faith to a younger generation. Psalm 145 verse four says one generation shall commend your works to another. And shall declare your mighty acts. This is what we do when we gather here and we sing praises and we want our kids. And they may not be paying attention all the time. And they may make some noise. We get it. But they're going to catch something. God going to do something in their hearts as they keep gathering with us. And as we make them gather with us. Don't be leaving your kid at the house giving you a choice. Baby, you want to go? No, you ain't got no choice. (laughs) I know it's a different world we living in, but. My mom and them and daddy didn't give us a choice. Come on, That's right. But it wasn't, it wasn't there. They didn't do that to force it down our, our throats, but they knew that the benefit, they knew the, they knew the grace that would come from that. They knew the work that God could possibly do to draw us to Jesus. So we need to pass on the faith. We need one generation. We need, we need the baby boomers. Declaring God's work. We, 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 need, we, need the, we need the busters. We, we need the millennials. We need the Gen Xers. We need, we need the Gen Z. Whatever the, we, we need generations upon generations declaring to younger generations the mighty works of God. Here's the third reason why we ought to gather stones of remembrance. The third reason is that it shows the continuation of God's involvement between the generations of the people of God. It shows the continuation. It's right there in verse 23. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you pass over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us. Do you see between the generations? Do you see how it's showing that God is continually at work within generations, between generations? God's mighty wonders helps us to bridge what we term as a generational gap. The division that we sometimes see and experience in the church is oftentimes due to shallow reasons. Wow. Wow. Say that. Say that. There's divisions and Speech. generational fights in the church. And, yes. and it's because we're, we're making too much of our preferences yeah. and our styles. We're making it that preeminent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What if it's the older generation that, you know, feels that, you know, you ought to come to church, you know, wearing your Sunday best. Well, there's a younger generation like myself and others who feel like, you know, it's about the heart, not necessarily the dress. But we fight over stuff like that when we shouldn't be fighting over stuff like that. Because who should be preeminent among us is not a style of preference. It's God himself. That when we make when we make much of Jesus, when we make much of what he has done on the cross, when we make much of what he is continuing to do in our lives, then all of that stuff seems to pale in comparison. Yeah then it doesn't even really matter if you come in a suit and a tie. Bless you. Come on. It doesn't matter if you come with chucks and jeans, you know, and a T-shirt. It doesn't matter. Come on. Because the, because the focus is not on you and I anyway. The focus is on God himself. So it's a continuation of God's involvement between the generations. We need, we need to gather these stones so we can, we can tell young people and they can see that the same God that did it for me the same God that did it for Big Mama is the same God that can do that for you. And will do that for you. When you come to place your trust in Jesus, he will be your God and you will be his child and he will work miraculously in your life. David said, I was once young, but now I'm old. I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed or her seed begging bread. The same. Listen, may be different rivers, as I told you, but it's the same God may be a different generation. It's the same God may be a different time that we're living in, but it's the same God. The same God. 
Number four, let me hurry to a close. Number four, the fourth reason that we need to gather stones of remembrance is that it serves as a witness to people who don't know God. It's right there in verse 24. Verse 23 says, for the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over. Verse 24, here it is, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty. Yeah, yeah. This is why we, and let me, yeah. let me tell you, this is why you need to make your stones visible. Yeah. One, of, one of the things that I appreciate, and, I, and, and you, you may have seen this or not, one of the things I appreciate about Jada Pinkett Smith's Red Table uh-huh. is that it's displaying, as she said in their recent episode on domestic violence, testimonies of their life to help other people out. That they're willing to bring out stones, if you will, times in their lives, hard times and good times, to bring this out on this table in front of the the whole world via YouTube so that people could benefit from it. Mm -hmm. And if if you got somebody who who is creating the image of God but don't really know if they know Jesus, like Will Smith and Jada Pinkett Smith, who are willing to, to, to testify come on, Doc. Come to on. just lessons they've learned in life come on, come to on. benefit people. How much more come on, come on, Doc. should the redeemed of the Lord say so? How, how much more should those of us who have a relationship with the God of heaven and earth be willing to bring our stones to the come table? On, Not just to benefit your life and try to make your life better, but to put you in contact with the God who can change your life, with the God who can change your eternal destiny come on, yeah. in Christ. If they're willing to come out on YouTube and put their stones and their issues on the table, then I want to encourage us, not just them being the motivation, but the sense is if they could do it, we ought to do it even more so. I want to encourage you, man. I want to encourage you because I, I feel you. I feel somebody pushing back and you're like, what, what about my reputation though? I got an image to portray. No, you don't. No, you ain't got no image to uphold. You got his image to uphold. You got Jesus's image to uphold and his worth to behold and and, and to proclaim. Be worried about that and not your image and your reputation. Your testimony can point people to Jesus. Your testimony may be something that God can use to draw somebody to Jesus. I'm trying to help you. You you and I need to share. You and I to be yes wisely, yes prayerfully, but, but my goodness, we, 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 too many of us are concealing things that God has done. He's done some wonders in your life, has he not? And I'm, I'm not beating you up. I'm just saying, but you, my baby, brother, why you ain't shared that with nobody? Do you know how God could use that to draw them to Christ? I know, I know it was a hard moment in your life. I know it was probably a shameful moment in your life. I know that you don't necessarily want to reveal that in your life. But if God has saved you, he's delivered you and delivering you from that and growing you from that at some point. Maybe not now. Maybe it's too fresh. I get it. Maybe it's too fresh. But at some point, you ought to pray to God to give you strength to bring that stone out on the table that he might use that to draw somebody to his son. God, I'll serve as a witness to people who don't know God. We need to tell people hmm. that God, God did this. <laughs> he did this for me. And you may not believe it. You may not believe God did it, but I know God did it. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you God did it anyway. And I'm going to trust that the Holy Spirit is going to work on your heart to open your eyes so that you can see that there was a God that was behind this yeah. miraculous wonder in my life. It was God who healed me. It was God who saved me. It was God who picked me up out of the miry clay. It was God who picked me out of my sin. It was God who turned my life around. It was God who changed my attitude. It was God who saved my marriage. It was God who put me on the right track. It was God who kept me sane when everything was insane around me. It was God who did that. It was God who kept me through that storm. It was God who kept me through that trial. I wanted to give up. I wanted to throw in the towel. I didn't see no way through. It was God who did it. It was God who provided the job. It was God who brought me another mate. It was God who kept me, helped, kept me whole and, and kept me together. I got kids in the room. 
Just look at the image. Kept me together. Y'all got, <laughs> are y'all with me? Because <laughs> you know, if, you, if it was up to you, you... Celibate, what's that? <laughs> you didn't know what celibacy was. You, you ain't, it wasn't even in your dictionary until God stepped in your life. It's God is helping you handle that task on the job. It's God helping you handle that job responsibility. It's God is the one that's giving you the skill set and the education and all of that, the wherewithal to do that project and do it well. That's God. That's a stone, y'all. Those are stones of remembrance and to be a witness to the people who don't know God. It ain't luck. It ain't chance. It ain't the weather. It ain't Mother Earth. It ain't the big man upstairs. The big guy in the sky. No, he got a name and his name is Jesus. He got a name and his name is God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. Call his name. So I'm telling you, quit being ashamed of his name. Tell people that he's the one that was, that's responsible. He's the one that, that's responsible. He's the one that's why I'm married today. Amen. Happy, happily. And maybe it may not be happily all the time. Come on, God. But he's why I'm still married. Come on, son. He is why. Yeah. Won't it? Yes, he will. <laughs> he's the reason why. I'm not running the streets. He's the reason why I ain't clubbing like I used to. He is the reason why I ain't smoking like I used to. He's the reason why I ain't getting drunk like I used to. He's the reason why. He is the reason why. Why I'm not as insecure as I used to be. He is the reason why. I got validation in him and I don't seek it in other stuff. He is the reason why. I'm not going from a relationship to a relationship. He's the reason why I'm content. He's the reason why I'm satisfied. He's the reason why I'm saying he is the reason. He is the reason. <laughs> He's the reason why I budget better. He is the reason why I'm not as, as, as materialistic as I used to be. He is the reason why I'm paying off my debt. He is the reason why I'm not buying the newest fashion and going out and living paycheck to pay. He is the reason. <laughs> I got to leave y'all alone. He, he is the reason. All the benefit, all the good stuff you see is because of him. All of it. He's the reason I don't cuss as much as I used to. He's the reason why I don't fly off the handle as quickly as I used to. He is the reason why I'm not jealous like I used to be or I don't slander or gossip like I used to. He is the reason. He's the reason why I'm not as negative as I used to be. He is the reason. Why I don't give you the deuces all the time? Because I would give people the deuces all the time. He is the reason why I'm bearing with you. Because God knows I'll get in my car and I'll be gone. I'll be gone out of a relationship. i just leave the family. Don't ask me to come up with Thanksgiving no more. I ain't coming for Thanksgiving. I'm leaving this family alone. He is the reason why I gave you another chance. He is the reason why I forgave you. He is the reason why I'm trusting you again. He is the reason why. <laughs> he's the reason why I'm caring. He's the reason why I'm parenting my kids the way I'm parenting my kids, even though I didn't have a father or even though I didn't have a mother or even I came from a broken background and a broken home. This is the reason why my home is becoming more whole and more godly and more holy is because he is the reason. He is the reason. He's teaching me how to be a mama. He's teaching me how to be a father. He's teaching me how to be a good brother. He's teaching me how to be a good sister. Okay. Yeah. He's doing it. Number five. Number five. Last one. Last one. The reason why we ought to gather stones is because it helps to engender devotion to and reverence for God among his people. It helps to engender devotion to and reverence for God among his people. Last verse. Verse 24. Says the reason why you need to gather these stones up, Israel, harvest, Christians, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the, land, the hand of the Lord is mighty. Watch this. The last phrase. You see it? That you, <laughs> the people of God, may fear the Lord, your God, forever. You want to know? I'm done. I'm closing my eyes. You want to know why we don't fear God as much? It's because we have got forgotten him. You remember 
When you remember what, he done, what he's done for you on the cross, when you remember what he's done for you in Jesus, when you remember how lavishly he forgave you, and it helps you to fear God and forgive other people. Amen. It's when we have forgotten that. Come on, come this is what Peter talks about. And even in the New Testament where he puts us in remembrance. Yeah. Where Paul told Timothy, put people in remembrance. Wow. Tells him over and over again, remember, remember, remember. Don't forget what God has done for you in Christ. Because that is the ultimate motivation for you living holy. For you loving and having faith. It's not what people do to you or have done to you. It's what Jesus has done for you. I need to tell you that it's good to have these stones of remembrance. But the most authentic testimony to your children, the most authentic witness you and I have to the world of God's wondrous works in Christ and in our lives as Christians is not an inanimate stone, but it's rather a living stone. A, a, a living stone. This is what Peter talks about. First Peter. Yes, yes, yes. That as we come to the living stone, Christ. He as we as his people, we like living stones are being built up into a spiritual house. A priesthood that's giving sacrifices that are pleasing unto God in Christ. If you want if you want if you want your children to, to see a good witness. Don't, 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 don't just have a Bible on, in your home on, or have a cross on your wall or Christian stencil art on, in your foyer. All that's good. Those are stones, too. But the best stone is your life. Is your, is your live your life. The way you live your life. The way you are devoted to to Jesus, the way you worship Jesus, the way you obey Jesus, that is the best testimony that you can give to the world and to your children. They need to know that you've had an encounter with the living stone, with the rock of ages. There's on him. I close with this. It says rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood for thy riven side which flowed. Be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from guilt and power. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I bring. I cling. You want to be a living testimony? Then cling to Christ. Submit to Christ. Obey Christ. So that all the peoples of the world may know that they may see that God's hand is mighty to save in Christ. And that the people of God, it will encourage us and engender us to be devoted to Jesus and to fear him for the rest of our life in every area of our lives.